Let's continue now where we left off. So right here, inside of our paint method, we wrote our first brush by saying if the choice equals brush zero, we called graphics fill oval, and then we drew an oval in the graphics context at that particular spot, at that particular x, y, although we adjusted it a little bit so it would be centered, of that size, that size variable. So now we'll throw in an else if statement, and I'm just going to zoom in. So now it'll be else if choice dot equals, and it'll be brushes spot one. So the next graphics thing we're going to be doing is the open oval, okay, and you can see that from up here where I had pasted in the stuff we'd put in the array. The open oval is done basically the same way. You just say graphics dot, but instead of fill oval, okay, the um, method we want to use is uh, draw oval. And again, you can read the Java documentation on this. It says draws the outline of an oval, which means it'll just have an outline and it won't be filled in. But basically, draw oval will then use the same parameters as fill oval. So as a matter of fact, you can just paste them in. So this will now allow you to use brush one as well. So I'm going to do a real quick test on that. I'm going to run that. So my default brush is brush zero, the filled oval. If I use my wheel and click, I can now select the open oval. And there you can see the open oval. And remember, I can still roll my mouse to change the size of that. So that's how I can use the draw oval versus fill oval. Now we're going to do the exact same thing with the next two brushes, which is the filled rectangle and the open rectangle. Okay. So now the ovals are done. We'll do filled rectangle and open rectangle next. Okay. And again, they work basically the same way. So I'm just going to copy and paste, move this to brush two, and instead of draw, uh, sorry, instead of fill oval, it's the 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 method is fill rect. So they shortened rectangle to just fill rect, R E C T. <coughs> But you can see that the parameters are the same, x, y, width, height. And to finish the next one, I can just copy and paste that, else if, switch this to brush 3, and it's, instead of fill at rect, it's open rect. Uh, oh, sorry, draw. Should be called open. There we go, draw rect. And so those are the methods that we can call upon for the first four brushes. And let's test that. So the default brush, double click my mouse or click my wheel, put an open oval. That one works. Click my wheel, filled rectangle. That one seems to work. Click my wheel, open rectangle. That one seems to work. So there you can see all four brushes in action there. Just by calling on different graphics methods of this graphics object. And again, a lot of then using some of this high-end code is just you sort of experimenting with this. All right, so let's jump to the next one. The next one we had was the 3D rectangle. So this is another, now it's not, don't get too excited. It's not really that exciting, this 3D rectangle. But I'm going to bring that one into play. So I'm going to put another ELSIF in. I'm going to put brush 4. And, and this one, is there's one called the filled 3D rect. So just add, but it adds a parameter. Okay, so with this one, it has a final parameter. So it has the x, the y, the width, the height, and then it has a Boolean variable called raised, which determines whether the rectangle appears to be raised above the surface or etched into the surface. So it's like a true false parameter you add at the end. So you can use the same code and then at the very end add a parameter like the word true right here. And that will give you the option now for using brush 5, the uh, 
So I'm going to select that one, the 3D rectangle. And it's hard to see in black, to be honest with you. So I'm just going to change the color. And I'll make it bigger so you can see. So that's what the 3D rectangle looks like. It has a slight sort of button-like look to it. Like I said, it's not that exciting um, versus the regular rectangle. And if you just set this to false, it honestly doesn't even look that radically different there as well. But I'll just show you. Change up some colors. Select the 3D rectangle. And that has sort of an inset look, sort of a like it's been clicked in. So to be honest, these graphics methods are not that exciting, but they are used for things like drawing actual buttons on the screen. So they can have that sort of inset, outset look to sort of create a, um, a raised or lowered effect. But, so it's not that exciting. <coughs> okay, then I'm going to use ELSIF for the next one, for brush 5. With this one, um, we're going to be drawing, if you remember back here, after the 3D rectangle, the next thing to draw is the arc. Now this again is handy if you know your geometry. So the method is draw arc. And again, the way that your geometry can come in handy is the way you interpret the parameters. So here you can see the way the parameters work, x and y is the spot to draw it, width and height is the width and the height of the arc, but the arc has to be defined geometrically. So start angle is the beginning angle, and arc angle is the angular extent of the arc relative to the start angle. So I'm going to give you a couple numbers to play with for that one. So the way I'm going to say draw arc is to just use x and y. Don't bother with the minus size thing. And then use uh, size and size as the two parameters after that. But then the next two numbers to use as parameters, I would suggest 45 as the initial angle and 130 as the other angle. Just to see what that does. It's going to make like an eyelash so you can just sort of see. So you could have called that eyelash. But that's what I'm going to suggest for draw arc. X, Y, size, size, 45, 130. And you can test that particular one. And again, that's definitely something you could play with. Um, if you were to develop this into, say, a, a project, maybe you'd give the user the option of actually changing those arc values. But here you can see that's the arc brush right there. OK. Kind of cool for making clouds or mountains or something. All right. So now we have six brushes happening here. The next two are going to be the most complex. And we have to think about what they're going to be doing. A filled polygon and an open polygon. Here again, your knowledge of geometry comes in handy. What is the definition of a polygon? Well, let's see what your math skills are. What's the definition of a polynomial? Oh, I weep for the math students of tomorrow. A polygon is a shape of multiple sides, right? Technically, a square is a polygon. A triangle is a polygon. It poly means many, okay? It essentially means more than two. So in order to define a polygon, we have to define the number of sizes. So here's what we're going to do next. At the end of this else if, we're going to put an else. Okay? So there'll be a big else statement here. I'm going to zoom in on this. <coughs> so the first thing we're going to make is a little integer variable called scale. And scale will be half the size, so size divided by 2. Don't worry about what that does. It's going to come into play in a second. We will also define the number of points. The points would be, again, if you were drawing a polygon, if I said three points, one, two, three points, each one will have an x, y, right? Like each point will have an x, y coordinate. But the reason you draw points for a polygon is then it connects them to create the polygon. 
If I said give me four points, if I said a fourth point or five points, it's going to draw a different shape based on those points. So it's like good old connect the dots here. We need to tell it how many points we're going to be drawing and then what x and y all those points are. So we're going to give this thing 10 points. Okay? The next thing we need to define is all the x points. All the points for all, there's going to be 10 of them. So we're going to make an integer array called x points. It's going to be an array of points. That's handy to use the array for this. And we don't have to um, say equals new integer. We can use our, round, our uh, curly brackets to just give it the values that it needs. So that's how we're going to define the x points, like that. Now we're not going to put 0. I just put that there for now. We're going to do the exact same thing with the y points. So x and y points will be just like that. Now in a minute I'm going to give you all those points. It, it's going to take a second to just put in all 10 of them. And then we'll use an if statement after that. So if you just hold your patience there for a second. Then we'll say if choice dot equals, okay, brushes, um, what number are we at? Uh, I don't even remember. We're at 6, yeah. So if we're at brush 6, then we will draw one of the polygons. And then finally, we'll have the else if for brush 7. And if we ever wanted to add more brushes, we, we could. We could just continue expanding on that else if statement. But the way it's going to work is we're going to say graphics dot, the first one will be called a filled polygon. And here you can see there are two options. Whoa for creating the filled polygon. One is to pass it a polygon object, which is obviously some fancy class that we don't have. And the other one is to give it an array of x points. Oh, luckily that's exactly what we're making. An array of y points and the number of points. We have all those variables ready to go. So that's the one we're going to use is fill polygon with that set of parameters, x, y, and points. Perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. And then down here, it's the same thing, graphics dot draw polygon, and it's the same thing. There is, however, with draw polygon, a third option called draw polyline. And uh, let me just explain what that one is in a second. Let me just get this one on there, x points, y points, points. The difference between a polygon and a polyline is just this. Okay, so say I gave you four points, and I said I want you to put a point here, a point here, a point here, and a point over there. A polygon, the way it will draw it on the screen is it'll start at the first point, connect to the second, the third, the fourth, and then a polygon knows to then go back and complete the shape by going back to the first one. A polyline doesn't. It just stays like that. It doesn't complete the shape. Which is why with a filled polygon, you don't have that option. Because in order for it to be filled, it has to complete the shape. But with a draw poly, it doesn't. It could just draw a complex line, essentially. So think about that. You can now draw complex lines, and you could draw complex shapes that are either filled or unfilled on the screen. Okay, so now I have to give you all these x and y points. Okay, so let's uh, go here. This is what I'm going to suggest you should do for the 10 points. You should go x, comma, x plus scale, comma, x plus scale times 2 comma x plus scale comma x plus scale times 2. I kind of have a plan in mind here so comma and I'm just going to move down a line here just to so I'm going to try and space these out so that um, 
They're easier for you guys to read on the projector. And then X, comma, whoop. X minus scale times 2. Just using extra spacing to try and uh, make this more readable for you guys. And then X minus scale. And then, where were we? So i got to get all 10 points in. X minus scale times 2. And scale. OK, so let me just double check that. So x, x plus scale, x plus scale times 2 x plus scale, x plus scale times 2, x, x minus scale times 2, x minus scale, x minus scale times 2, x minus scale. OK. <coughs> so that's what I would suggest for the x points. For the y points, it's going to be a similar sort of set here. So I'll get those typed in. Scale y plus scale times two. Uh, y. I think that's it. Let me just double check. Uh, y minus scale, y, y, y plus scale, y plus scale times 2, y plus scale, y plus scale times 2, y plus scale, y, y. Okay, this is very exciting. You guys are going to see the, what all these coordinates create. You might be thinking, what is this polygon? Well, get ready. Here it is. I'm going to show you, and then I'll leave it up there so you guys can key that in. But get ready. Here comes brush 7 and 8. This is the filled polygon. Get ready. Whoa. It's a star. Now, every year, I get students complain that it's a crappy star. But it's a star. Okay? It's, it is a star. All right. So I'm just going to... Um, Okay, so here's the method now, and all this is what paint does. So we've defined this big method paint here. It's not honestly that complex though, this method. It's just a big else if statement that switches between all the brushes. Which brush do I use? And then which method do I call from the graphics library? So you're not writing really your own logic here. You're just using all this logic that's built up for you. But it's a matter of figuring out how do I call a method of another class um, that I didn't write. OK? So that concludes graphics example three. So there is, if we go back to the beginning, the three graphics examples, all coded by us by hand, just run them all together. So the first one 
peanut butter jelly time guy here, was just an example of how you can use these libraries to build J-frames that you're used to, to build um, components like images and J-labels. The second example we did, this little calculator program, was designed to just show you how you can do that and have it react to user actions, like for example, clicking a button. And then the final one, then the one that we just finished, did the same thing, but tried to get things a little more complex by actually showing things like mouse actions and dialog boxes and drawing features and graphics features. <coughs> so all the stuff that we've learned, mashing together now with a little bit of what you guys saw last year in C Sharp. But now it's time to try out what NetBeans provides for you as an editor that is similar to what C Sharp gives you. So the next thing I want you guys to do is I want you to add a file to your project, a new file, which you can do by clicking the button or going through the menu. But this time, where I want you guys to go is this time I want you to go into this section right here called Swing GUI Forms. So what we have here is essentially the same thing we just hard-coded. And here you can see all the different types you can choose from. So just real quick, um, the first two are the ones that you guys have been using. Well, actually just the second one, a J-frame. That's the one we've been using. The one above it, J-Dialog, what that one is, is it is essentially just like what J-Option Pane gives you. It's a form that has to be clicked on before you can do anything else. So it's like a little, little open or close or save dialogue. You can create your own custom dialogue form through J-Dialog if you want. Then the other ones are kind of variations on this, but when we get down to this one called applet form, those are ones to use within embedded web pages. So that's where Java uses it for applets that are embedded inside of web pages. Now, as well, as the swing GUI forms, there's actually another set of GUI forms built inside of the AWT library. AWT, as you may recall, is a heavyweight library that will attempt to mimic the operating system. But for now, let's use the one we're more familiar with. Um, we're going to select JFrame form and click Next. So it'll ask you for the name of it. So let's just keep our style going. Let's just call this Graphics 4. We've already made a graphics one, two, and three, so let's make a graphics four and click finish. So here now, knowing that it's launching a GUI form, it launches NetBeans Visual Editor, okay? So this should look somewhat familiar to you from the C-sharp days. It's gonna provide you with a basic form over here. It's gonna provide you with a toolbox palette over here and even a properties palette over here. Now, before you guys go and play around with it, which I will want you to do, absolutely I want you to play around with it, but let's see what this would look like by going back to this, the graphics examples main, and trying to just do this, graphics 4 equals new graphics 4. Would that be enough to make it appear? Well, let's see. I'm going to run it without doing anything to my editor. That's my third one. That's my second one. That's my first one, but the fourth one is not showing up yet. So, we have this visual editor, but we have no way of making it appear on screen yet. But I want to point out something interesting. Here in the projects window, where you now have a collection of all your Java files for this project, okay? Notice that we have our Dialogues class that was just a helper class. We have Graphics 1, Graphics 2, Graphics 3, and now Graphics 4 is in our project. But notice something in the icons here. This one, Graphics Example, that's where we put our main. We wrote main in there. And whenever you write main in a class, it puts a little triangle there to tell you that that's where main is. But look at what Graphics 4 has. Graphics 4 also has a triangle. 
because the GUI editor automatically wrote a main inside of there. So now the project is conflicted. Which main should I run with? Should I run with the one you guys wrote or should I run with this one? Since you guys set this project up early, it picked the one that you guys wrote. It's not going to run that one first because it doesn't think you need it first. But where did it even write that code? So the first thing I'm going to show you about the GUI editor is there is a button up here right near the tab of where it is where you can go to the design, which is what we're looking now, and beside it, the source code. So this is very similar to C Sharp, how you could kind of switch back and forth there. So there is where you can now click on source. And here's the code that NetBeans is writing for you. Except there's a section of code hidden away. Now the first thing you might see as you look down through this code is sure enough, there's that main that I've been talking about. So if I want, and I suggest this, you can actually delete that main. You don't need it there. And then they even added a little bit of kind of confusing code to it. So I'm just going to delete main right out of there. Now, some other stuff it's put in there is very similar to our code. It said, it wrote this thing that said, okay, I'm going to write you a graphics for that extends. And we just put JFrame when we put extends. But the way the editor does it is it puts this there. Why does it do that? Why, why do you think that that's why it puts it so long and confusing? The reason it does that is that way it, has to, it avoids writing an import statement up here. We actually don't have to put import because it's kind of importing it at the time it's using it. Both ways are fine. Um, this just happens the way that the, this automated code writes it that way. And again, this, the whole idea with using an automator like this is you don't want to worry too much about the code. You'll let it do the coding for you. But that doesn't mean you can't edit this code. You can if you want to. But basically, it's saying that J Graphics 4 is a JFrame, just like what we had done. <coughs> OK. But here's the weird part. When it creates this design, it also creates a method that you cannot touch. So right here is the constructor for Graphics 4. It wrote a constructor for you. And inside that constructor, it calls one method called init or initialize components. Where is that method? It's not there, but it is there. It is hidden with it this block here and it even tells you that it says hidden within here is the init components method and I don't know if you notice here but there's a little plus sign right there that implies that there's more code right there and that's exactly correct there is more code right there there's code that NetBeans wrote to create that GUI but here's the the funny thing about it you cannot edit it you cannot edit this code. You try to go in there and change it, it does not let you. Okay? So areas that are in this gray coloring are uneditable code because you're using the editor. The only way to edit that code is to go out to the editor and create edits. Okay? So what you have to do when using this GUI editor is use a combination of what you did in C Sharp, dragging and dropping and actually creating look and feel, and adding code as well. So let's try that. Let's try something simple. Let's go over here to the swing controls, and let's grab our first component, a classic button. Now be careful, there's two types of buttons. There's one called a toggle button, and then one just called button. Use the one just called button, and drag it over onto your design. Now when you place it, you'll notice that it uses some guideline things to help sort of position it. So you can kind of move it around. You can resize it if you want. You can do the same thing with the frame or the form. You can drag it to resize it. So that looks good. Now just like C Sharp, in order to edit the text on this button, you go over here to the properties window. 
And sure enough, just like C-sharp, it has a bunch of properties, including text, the same one as in C-sharp. So I can, for example, make this an exit button by just typing exit. So there's my exit button. Okay. So now, this looks pretty good. It's just got one button sitting in the middle here. If I go to the source, again, I don't see anything because it is all hidden within that piece of code there. But you can actually see within that hidden code basically the exact same code that we wrote. Create a new button. Set the text. Okay? Etc. Now, it also uses a layout manager to position it. <coughs> it uses a bit of a more complex layout manager. It uses something called a group layout. And then it has to set sort of the alignment of that group layout. Maybe I don't want that. Maybe I don't want to have this group layout thing happening. If you want to change the layout manager using the editor, right click on the design and go to set layout right here. So here you have the same option you had in code to set it to, for example, the flow layout that we used in the first example, the null layout. There are lots of different layouts that you can use. So I'm, for example, I'm going to set mine to the null layout. Set layout, null layout. And now I'm going to go back to my source and take a look at that generated code. Look how small it is now. It just says, create a J button, set the default close operation, set the layout to null, set the text, add the button to the content pane, set the bounds. This is exactly the same code that we wrote when we did it by hand. But it's doing it for you as the GUI editor. It also makes a call to a method called pack. We did not use that method for a good reason, but it still exists there. Strangely as well, C Sharp, or pardon me, NetBeans likes to put its properties at the bottom when it does a visual editor. So this is actually one of the properties, a J button right here. Now, you might be having questions like, how do I name that J button? Like, I don't want to call it J button 1. I want to call it like exit or something like that. To name components, if you want to name them in C Sharp, or pardon me, I keep saying that, in NetBeans, the easiest way is to just right click and change variable name. However, another way you can do it is to have this side window up called the navigator. So if you have this side window here called the navigator open, right here, it also provides you with a way to name and see your components. Again, this is very similar to what C Sharp used. So having a navigator here is a handy way to select your objects and rename them. So right here, with the navigator open, I can either just right click and re rename it, or I can even just sort of single click on it until it gives me the option to say, oh, well, I'm going to call this BTN exit. And now it's renamed. And if you look at the source code, it'll be renamed in your source code as well. It'll all be renamed. So here, it now seems to be working. But why can't I get it to show up? I'm playing it, but it's not showing up. I'm still seeing graphics 3, 2, and 1, but not graphics 4 yet. Well, again, just like before, it won't make it visible until you tell it to make it visible. So I'm going to go into the source code and add a line to my constructor. This dot set visible to be true. The same line that I had added when I coded it by hand. Now let's try this. I'm going to run this. And there's three. There's one. And there's two, and believe it or not, there's four right there. But the problem with it is it has no size. I have to actually resize it myself, and then I see my exit button. So there it is. So that was a pain. I want to fix that so I can go back to my code and use the same stuff I did with the other one. I can set the size to be 
and I'll give it, say, 500 by 500 as a size or something like that, just to try sizing it that way. So the point I'm getting across here is this GUI editor is super handy in a lot of ways, but in the, also in other ways, it, it may not actually be what you're looking for. You may have to use a combination of that editor and your own code to make this kind of exactly what you want it to be. So there it is. Okay, button doesn't work, but at least the edit, the design is there. So for a designer, I can start throwing things on there. Like I can put a radio button on there. I could put a checkbox on there. I could put a label on there. I can resize these objects. I can change properties. For example, if I want my label to actually be a picture, I can find the property here called icon. Oh, that's handy. So if I go to icon and then click on the little ellipse, I've got this little feature that says, oh, again, very much like C sharp, I could import images into my project. Oh, well, that's handy. Let's try that. So I'm going to try and import something into my project. Sounds cool, but where can I get a graphic? Oh, here's that pick, that peanut butter jelly guy pick. I'm going to import that, and I'll just hit finish. So there it is now. It's imported that into my project. That's cool. And I'll click OK. And now if I make that J label big enough, oh, look, there's the graphic on there. So it's doing a lot of the work that we had to do in code by using the editor there. So that's pretty cool. So I'll run that. And sure enough, my new one with the visual editor has radio buttons and buttons and images. It's got everything I need. So this could be, for a lot of you, a great solution for doing this thing. And you could play with things like maybe I want to try a progress bar. Maybe I want to try a text area. Maybe I want to try a list box. And there's tons of stuff here. A spinner, whatever that is. A slider. All of these are component objects. Now, each one will have a little bit of a learning curve to learn how to use that particular object. Um, but anyways, I could just try that and look at all these neat components that theoretically I could play around with. Sliders and spinners and radio buttons and list boxes and all that stuff. How could I get them to do anything? Well, again, this editor will try to help you with that a little bit. So let's just take one of the components, the one that's the easiest to use, the button. In C Sharp, when I wanted to code a button, all I would have to do is double click it. Well, this editor does the same thing. If I double click the button, it jumps me to a piece of code. It says button action performed, and it says to do, add your code here. So for example, I'm just going to want to shut this program down. So I'll just go system dot exit bracket zero. Same code we learned back on the first day. I'll just exit this program. Will that work? So let me run it. And I'll try my exit button. And yeah, it worked. It shut everything down. Perfect. Again, what's actually happening is inside of your code, it's doing what we had already done. It's adding an action listener all the same kind of way we did. It's putting that code in for you. It's hiding it. It's leaving it uneditable. But it's actually doing stuff. Now, what if it's not the click event I wanted? Or what if it's one of these more exotic type things, like a slider? How do I know what the code I'm putting with it is? Well, another way you can deal with this editor is to right-click on objects. Not to double-click them, but to right-click on them and go to events. Here, for example, you see there's lots of different events I can deal with. For example, keyboard events or mouse events. So when I go back to the button and right click and go to events, notice that it did the default action event, but I could have also done mouse events, just like we did when we did our third example. So a lot of this is you playing around with it. But I'm going to add one more wrinkle to this. So that looked all pretty cool. Okay, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger, not just 15 by, or make this a lot larger. There we go. Um, in the designer, you guys have been right now adding stuff from Swing. 
And Swing has a whole bunch of cool buttons and labels and stuff like that. But in addition to Swing, if you go further down this GUI editor, there's the AWT library. Not just the Swing, but also AWT. And it also has buttons and labels and check boxes and, and choice boxes and all these cool things, text fields and list boxes and scroll bars. Like I'm just going to put a, that's it. I'll put that one on there. So now, what's, what's the difference? Why should I use this button versus that button? And why should I use this checkbox versus that checkbox? Well, the first thing you might notice is they look different, right? That button there, the swing button, has a different look than this button up here. Same with this checkbox versus that checkbox. And this text field versus this text field, etc. So there's slightly different look and feel. But who remembers the bigger point there? It's not just a matter of the look, but it's a matter of the weight of these components, whether they're heavy or lightweight. Okay? So how they draw on the different systems will be dependent on that. Okay, so now you have a ton of different graphics options here for doing a GUI design. I'm going to be honest with you. Some students love this GUI editor because it's very much like C Sharps and it makes designing really fast and really easy to create complex designs. Some students hate this GUI editor because it takes so much control away from you as a programmer because you can't actually sometimes get it to work exactly the way you want it to work. Whereas if you code it all yourself, maybe you can. I think the best solution is sometimes a bit of a hybrid approach where maybe you use this for a little bit of stuff and then code a little bit differently. And I'm going to talk about that in the example we're going to be doing, um, the optional example that I'll be doing uh, starting tomorrow.